Hello, my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for the University. And this video is a short presentation on the types of harm and risk in research, which is a component of the training module Research Ethics at MTU, the application process. I'll first start with taking an excerpt from our Human Research Ethics Policy in relation to research activity at the university involving human participants and what it should include in terms of respect, beneficence and justice. Now it's the beneficence I'd just like to focus on which is where it's stated that a researcher should have the moral obligation to do good and the moral obligation to do no harm. And this is taken from the Belmont report which is a reference going to be on the last slide to this presentation. And I suppose it's just the aspect of to do no harm very much aligns with the topic for, for this uh, video presentation. Also in our human research ethics policy, there is a, a mention of solidarity, which is where knowledge of the community where appropriate is essential in order to ensure that the research meets actual needs and is conducted in ways that are sensitive and respectful. And I suppose it's the sensitive and respectful that are the, bits, the parts that are would jump out in this bullet point here because if the research is not carried out in a sensitive manner or a respectful manner, well then that is the, where there is a risk of actual harm. And that's something that obviously we need to control for when we're looking at uh, carrying out this research study. And then the last point here, which is adapted from the bearer principles, looks at the responsibility of the researcher in relation to balancing uh, the benefits and uh, which and uh, sorry benefiting the benefits and risk or harm to participants sponsors and the wider community in relation a uh, wider community in terms of the researchers and the professionals so for all these videos what I try to do then is look at seeing what the topic of the video is and how does it fit with the actual application form so in relation to the minimal risk human research ethics application form in section C, question 7, it's called out if there is any risk above the level of experience in everyday life for the actual human participant, yes or no. And if it's yes, then you can see down at the very bottom of this bold, uh, uh, of, I suppose, of the screen grab, it states that in that case, then full ethical review uh, human research ethics application form must be completed. Now the exception to that would be if the research study that was carried out that was going to have some risk attached to it but the procedure to carrying out the research study was approved as in it was a pre-approved procedure by the human research ethics uh, committee and if that was the case then the minimal risk human research ethics application form would still be applicable. The second part, I suppose, just to uh, looking at the screen grab here of the other yes, no questions. And this, I suppose, relates to the human participants that are involved. And I suppose I won't go into this into massive detail because this is very much aligned with the, the screening checklist, which was covered in, in a previous video. And I suppose, again, it's if there is yes to any of these aspects or any of these points here, that the application by and large would end up having to be a full ethical review human research ethics application form in that case. When it comes to that full ethical review human research ethics application form in section C question 8 it calls out what are the risks to the participants in turn and it classifies them as extreme, high, some or minimal and I'll mention what they what we mean by them or give examples of them in the later slide but looking at the bottom parts of the screen grab there it says that if there are if there is going to be risks that it needs to be outlined how these will be controlled and how any harm to participants will actually be addressed. So you can see here in the full ethical review human research ethics application form risk and harm go hand in hand and I suppose information on both is expected in this case as well. So when it comes to harm in research uh, I suppose there's there's it's not again, I suppose I'm trying to think there, look, I don't want to be saying, oh, I want to create an exhaustive list because I can't create an exhaustive list. But I suppose it's to give examples of the types of harm that could be encountered in, in research and then it's 
for us as the researchers to see how do we manage this or how do we control this from actually taking place so it's a case of is there a a physical harm potential uh in the actual research study so this is where if with the research has been carried out could there be actual bodily harm to the actual participant and if there could be well then this is obviously something that needs to be controlled for or if it's a case of look that no matter what controls are put in place there still could be physical harm there's a risk of that well then obviously this needs to be outlined in the informed consent and in the information leaf that as well to the participants is there a potential for psychological harm so does the research study involve deception does the research study um, if i suppose the data is mishandled w- uh, would a per- per- participant's identity be known and could that lead to kind of maybe a mental stress or emotional stress or trauma and that would all fall under the bracket of kind of a psychological harm the next then will be a, a social harm so again if the information on the participant happened to be made public as in leaked by by accident or just wasn't managed correctly does that impact i suppose the participants social position does it impact the participants role in the community now the community obviously being in a very broad term to what the participants of community actually is the next will be financial harm so if again information about participation in the study happened to be made available could this impact uh the employment of the participant could impact the participant's insurance and if either of those actually happen then there's obviously other examples well then that's where there's a risk of a financial harm and then the last one in this one here is is there a risk for a harm to participants rights so this is a case of maybe if the informed consent process and the uh, and the informed consent process is something that would have been outlined in a previous video and it's that is and in that previous video it stated look that the informed consent process is not just the consent form it's what happens in the lead in and after as well but i suppose if that informed consent process isn't complete well is there harm then to a participant's rights in that case which you, there would be essentially also if there's a an impact or a lack of respect to a participant's autonomy well then that obviously impacts the participant's rights as well and i suppose with all these here essent- uh, examples like we're essentially looking at where we're gathering data from participants and when we're gathering data from participants there's a certain level potentially a level of harm to that and with harm then there's going to be a risk and i suppose then that really highlights that when we look at kind of gathering data from participants we should really be looking at the idea of data minimization which is something that is called out in our data protection policy that we don't need to see collect data that we have an idea to what our actual sample size should actually be and you can see on this slide here i mentioned a lot about where or oh, well, what happens if the data is leaked and if the data is leaked or made available that's obviously impacts the participant's confidentiality and the idea i suppose of confidentiality and data leakage or more more so data management that will be covered in a later video and as, and that's obviously something that's quite important that you uh, capture and uh, cover in detail as well when it comes to the risks in research and i suppose just as a bit of a refresher to what we mean by minimal risk so here's the quote which is taken from the protection of human subjects uh, which is from the us's uh, or usa's code of federal regulations and it's what is it as stated in our human research ethics policy as well and essentially this is where the research uh should not is not greater in or of the of itself then what is i suppose encountered in daily life whether that be kind of physical or psych- psychological or whatever the case actually is and when it comes to the risk and you'll see it in the previous slide we mentioned four aspects to it and i suppose the reason we're going with four and the reason often in research is going with four kind of options is what is found is if we go with an odd number and if someone is unsure of which way to go they'd often go with the middle ground so we're going with an even number of options it kind of i suppose just forces a small bit of thought to look what type of risk really is actually attached to the study if any at all so the first that we're looking at would be a minimal risk so a minimal risk is i suppose an example of that would be simple inconvenience so there there's a potential risk of inconvenience to a participant in being involved in the study so that is something obviously 
if that is the case, even if there wasn't going to be any minimal uh, risk around inconvenience, that is something that will be shared with the participant in the information leaflet and it will be something that the participant would agree to in the consent form. Equally, there could be uh, the next level of risk, sorry, will be some risk. Again, there can be loads of examples of this and I suppose the example that I'm looking at here, confidentiality now, I suppose this is not all aspects of confidentiality. This would be, I suppose, kind of where there can be a limitation to confidentiality. An example for that will be maybe focus groups. That if you have multiple participants in a focus group, well, obviously you cannot control for confidentiality there because the participants can more or often not actually see each other and they know what other participants are saying. And that could be maybe picked up in a, in a report. Now, that is the nature of the focus groups and it's obviously that's just the nature of that type of a research instrument but it's to be aware look that there is some risk of the limitation to confidentiality in that type of research study and then again that is something that would need to be called out in the information leaflet and the consent form another would be if there was high risk now high risk can be quite wide and varied to what high risk actually is but i suppose here it's i'm giving an example of where the participants, if they share information, they may be stigmatized or the participants may be stereotyped. And if that is the case, well, then that is where there's a high risk and uh, associated with that. And again, this is something that needs to be managed. It needs to be something that is controlled for. And then the extreme case uh, is where there is some adverse event. So with the, where there may be extreme physical harm. And so somebody might actually break a body part or something like that. Well, that will be where there will be an extreme risk. And again, if that if that's the case, it needs to be controlled for or, and it needs to be kind of shared with participants well in advance, obviously, of the study as well, if even it would even get research ethical approval. And obviously that all very much depends on the, what the research context is, what is the, what, who are the research participants, what is the research method and so on like that. As always with, uh, with all these uh, videos and the slides, they cannot be exhaustive of everything in relation to the topic. There's supposed to be a foundation uh, and really I suppose be nearly a catalyst for questions. And if there are any questions as always, I would encourage you to use the discussions function on the, the Canvas module, please, with an appropriate title to the actual discussion. And again, this is, I suppose, to really promote that whole shared learning environment when it comes to, uh, I suppose, research ethics at MTU and the application process where I suppose, uh, I suppose those that have registered for the module can actually answer each other's questions and obviously I have oversight of that as well and I'll be able to answer the questions also. The last thing here just to kind of explain the logic here to the references again because I'm not a fan of just sticking in references for the sake of it. So the first one is the bearer principles which, I, which is a reference that I would use in a lot of the videos and that I suppose very much links with the, the third bullet point on the, the first slide after the cover uh, slide. The, the quote for minimal risk comes from the protection of human uh, subjects in the USA. Uh, the Belmont report was obviously used, uh, used at the start as well. And then the, the, uh, the, I suppose the information around solidarity or the point around, point around solidarity was taken from the American Journal of Bioethics. And obviously, as always, without any of these references, these are additional to our internal codes, policies and procedures. Look, that's it uh, for this video. Um, all the best.